Good morning, everyone. I don't know if you guys were able to be on Facebook at all this week, but Amy made an announcement that I've been wanting to share with you for a long time, uh, and I have with many of you. But as many of you know, Amy has been pregnant for the last few months, and we found out whether it was a boy or a girl. And it's a boy. <laughs> and I'm really happy about that. <laughs> but uh, she is as well. And uh, as many of you know, I will be here for one uh, short month, a little less than that. And Pastor Barber has given me a wonderful going away gift. At any time that a sermon's going to be preached here, I'm going to be the one doing it. <laughs> so by the time I actually leave, maybe some of you will be thinking, finally. <laughs> No, but it's always wonderful to be here and to present the Word of God to you. It's a very humbling thing. And um, over the next few weeks, uh, I have a sermon series that I entitle, God With Us. And all that it is, is some of the fundamental teachings of our church um, in a little different perspective. And I pray that you're blessed this morning as we look at the Word of God together. Oh, I forgot my Bible. Um, Can we just bow our heads one more time for a word of prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, we just ask that you would draw close to us once again, that our distractions of life would be put aside and that our eyes would be fixed upon you. Lord, uh, give us understanding and give us your Holy Spirit above all else. This is what we ask in Jesus' name, let all God's children say, How far would you go to be with the people you loved? What would you do to ensure the safety and the security of your family? Is there any obstacle that you would allow that would prevent you from being close to the ones that you love? In Uganda, in a small town, there was word that began to spread about an unfortunate lot for many poor families who had been, I hate to say it, they'd been brutally murdered. Uh, the band of criminals who were responsible for these her, her, just terrible crimes, they defended themselves by saying that they were doing the victims of those who they had slain, the victims, that they were doing them a favor by putting them out of their misery. Just sick. In that same town, there was a young mother who had many children, and like many of our mothers here, she decided that she was going to do no matter what, she was going to do whatever it took to save her children, to make sure that her children were safe. And so at night, she would tuck her children into bed, into the little hut that she herself had put together. And at night she would stay up with her hand grasped to a machete. And she would stay up night by night holding on to her machete just in case someone were to come to her house and try to hurt her children. But fortunately, news came that the police had surrounded the criminals who were responsible for the terrible crimes. And they had found them in a sugarcane field. And they were trapped in that sugarcane field, so the police decided to light a fire in that sugarcane field in hopes that they would surrender, the criminals would surrender. But they didn't surrender. They came out shooting. But fortunately the police were able to stop them and apprehend them. Not too many people were hurt in a shootout. And the mother, who you guys saw, was so relieved that her children were safe. She didn't have to spend all night staying up with that machete. Her children were finally safe with her, and she could get some rest. 
And I like this story. There's many good stories because the story reminds me about Jesus. You know, like this mother, Jesus, he went through a great ordeal just to keep us safe. Because Jesus died on the cross for us, we have the opportunity to have eternal security in him. But have you guys ever wondered, since the death of Jesus, what has he been doing all this time? You know, Jesus died 2,000 years ago. That's a long time ago. Have you ever wondered, what has God been up to all this time? You know, this morning, I don't want to waste your time. I'm 26 years old, and I don't want to pretend like my ideas or my stories are more fascinating than someone else here. Uh, I don't want to waste your time telling you what I think. I want to spend some time telling you what the Bible says. Is that okay? I think that's why we're here. And so this morning, as we go to the Word of God, we can find a most reliable source of information about God. If there's anything that can tell us what Jesus has been up to this past 2,000 years, it's right in the Bible. So if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open them with me to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. As we do this, we're going to see, man, what has Jesus been up to? What has he been doing there in heaven? John, chapter 14, and... For those of you who don't have your Bibles and don't have them uh, available on your phones, I have it on the screen for you. John chapter 14, verse 1. This is what Jesus said he was up to. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus told his disciples that God the Father has a house. And that house is up in heaven, and it has many dwelling places. Some of your Bibles say many mansions. The meaning is it has many rooms. God's house in heaven has many rooms, and Jesus said that he's up there right now preparing the place for us. So whatever Jesus is up to in heaven, whatever that preparation work must be, it must be a difficult task. Because if it takes 2,000 years to get something ready, it's some extraordinary kind of work. Uh, and this is important. This is very important. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, there was still work that Jesus had to do in heaven in order for us to be there with him. Now, if you remember, Jesus, uh, when he created the world, he created it in how many days? How many days? Six days. And... You can remember some of the things that Jesus created. He said, let there be light, and poof, there was light. He said, let there be land, let it form, and out of nowhere, land began to form. Uh, Jesus said, creatures exist, run about, and do silly things. And lo and behold, creatures existed. They ran about and they did silly things like this cute little panda bear. Now, I need you guys to reason with me this morning. I need you to put on your thinking caps. If Jesus created the world in six days, then the dwelling place, the rooms that he's preparing for us in heaven, in his Father's house, if he created the earth in six days, the dwelling place in heaven that he's been preparing in, up in his father's house for so long, it must be so much better than anything here on earth. Because he's been working on it for 2,000 years. And if you can, can compare that for, to six days, that's a great difference of period of time. So the work that Jesus is doing in heaven in his father's house it must be a very special, intricate kind of work. And as hard as it is to fathom, guys, 
what's up in heaven for us is going to be so much better than anything here on earth. And it's something to look forward to. So to find out what Jesus has been doing up in heaven, I think it's safe to say that we need to know what God's house is. Jesus said, hey, I'm going to my Father's house. Well, what is the Father's house? Fortunately for us, we don't have to guess. The Bible uses the phrase, house of God, over, six, over 80 times. And each time the phrase, house of God, which is the same as the Father's house, is used synonymously or interchangeably with temple, with tabernacle, or with sanctuary. I was pretty proud of myself. You guys see that? <laughs> Uh, on the screen. You, I'll show you again if you missed it. House of God is used synonymously with temple, with tabernacle, and with sanctuary. And for the purpose of our study this morning and our short time here together this morning, I need you to know that according to the Bible, house of God is the same thing as God's sanctuary. So I need you to get that. That's very important. So say it with me. God's house is God's sanctuary. God's house is God's sanctuary. Jesus went to God's house in heaven to prepare it for us. And since God's house is God's sanctuary, then the work of preparation Jesus is doing in God's sanctuary is not just an ordinary work. It's a priestly work. Often when we hear this verse, we think Jesus is up there with a hammer and nails building our homes. No, he's doing a priestly work. But you know what? Don't take my word for it. Let's see what the Bible says. Mark chapter 16, verse 19 says, so, when, so then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. And the epistle of Hebrews tells us now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in, he in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So when Jesus went to heaven, when he ascended to the throne room of God, he sat at the right hand of God as a high priest. The Bible says our high priest is a minister, and maybe just for your guys, if I went too fast, he is a minister where? In the sanctuary. So Jesus' work in heaven, his priestly work in his father's house, is a special kind of work. It's all in a sanctuary. And this morning... Um, I don't want to pretend like I understand everything about God's priestly work. I haven't been there. And so I can't tell you exactly the perfect details that God is working out in heaven and the intricate work that he's doing, but I can tell you the purpose. I can tell you the purpose because for the last 2,000 years, the words in the Bible have stayed true and that Jesus is in heaven working in the sanctuary for one purpose. And it's on... It's on the screen, that where I am, there you may be also. So whatever Jesus has been up to this last 2,000 years, working as a priest, the purpose of it is very simple, that where he is, you can be also. And as God's house is represented by God's sanctuary. It's helpful this morning if we briefly go over the sanctuary on earth because it will help us know the kind of work that God is doing in heaven and earth. But the thing I need you to remember this morning is everything about the sanctuary is about Jesus. Everything about the sanctuary on earth is about the work of Jesus in heaven. So let's take a look at God's earthly house, the sanctuary, so we can see the kind of things that God is doing in heaven, in his heavenly sanctuary. If you go to the outer court of the sanctuary, I like these uh, pictures that I found, you get to the altar of burnt sacrifice in the outer court. And here at the altar of burnt sacrifice, you would have what people would 
bring to that altar was usually a little lamb. You know the story. Um, they would bring the lamb to the, uh, to the sanctuary and they would confess their sins on the little lamb. They would put their hand on the lamb and they would kill the lamb, the spotless lamb. And the blood would be used to minister for them in the sanctuary and because of the blood that was shed for the lamb, the sinner didn't have to die. But I, I need to tell you guys something. The sanctuary is all about who? The sanctuary is all about Jesus. So when John the Baptist saw Jesus come to the Jordan, he said, look, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He was using sanctuary language. He was describing what God was doing in, in Jesus. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because of the death of Jesus, we can have forgiveness of sins. Amen? Amen. As you move past the bronze altar, you see in the sanctuary this little teeny bowl, which was known as a bronze basin or a laver. And in that laver, there was water. The priests, after dealing with the blood of the animal, they would wash their hands to cleanse themselves to enter the sanctuary of God. But remember, this morning, what is the sanctuary all about? Don't get sick of it. What is the sanctuary all about? It's about Jesus. The blood of Jesus not only forgives us of sin, but it cleanses us of sin as well. And that's why, just like these young girls were baptized this morning, when we are baptized in the name of Jesus, we are accepting not only the forgiveness of Jesus, but the cleansing of Jesus as well, which is a powerful thing, the cleansing of sin. Now, when you leave the outer court, I know most of you have heard this, but it's good to review. When you leave the outer court, you get to the most holy place. And in the most holy... Pardon me. When you leave the outer court, you go into the sanctuary and you get to the holy place in this compartment. And in the holy place to the right was what is called the ta table of showbread. Can you say that with me? Table of showbread. Um, and that table of showbread, the priest would go into that room in that sanctuary and he would cook unleavened bread fresh every day. And he would place it on the table of showbread and that table of showbread didn't have any yeast in it. But remember, the sanctuary is all about who? Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so when we look to Jesus, we find that Jesus called himself the bread of life. Jesus is without sin. And Jesus is without yeast. <laughs> um, normally, you know, when you eat bread... Say if you guys go out to eat for dinner or you guys go out to eat for lunch, you're full, but how long does that satisfaction of the meal, how long does that last? A couple hours at most? I remember going out with my parents, I'd say, Mom, let's go out to eat. She's like, you just ate an hour ago. And I'd say, Mom, I'm starving. <laughs> uh, usually when you eat, it doesn't last for a long time. Uh, Amy said I could say this. Uh, if you're, if you're pregnant, it lasts even less. It lasts maybe mm, a couple minutes. But when you eat the bread of life, when you experience Jesus, the satisfaction, it doesn't last just momentarily, but it lasts forever. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. To the left inside the holy place, uh, you see what is known as the six-branch candle stand. Or they, people say it's seven, but it's really only six branches, the six-branch candle stand. And it's also known as the menorah. If you were to walk into the sanctuary of the Old Testament, this was the only piece of furniture that brought light to the sanctuary. This was the only furniture piece that gave light. And remember this morning, what is the sanctuary all about? It's all about Jesus. Jesus said he was the light of the world. 
Jesus called himself the light of the world because when you walk with Jesus, you don't have to walk in darkness. Jesus can give your life purpose. Jesus can give your life direction. Jesus can brighten your path. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Inside the sanctuary, past the table of showbread to the right and the candlesticks to the left was the altar of burnt, sac uh, the altar of burnt incense. It, this incense that was used to, to burn, uh, this altar that, was, that used incense, that incense was very special. It was a collaboration of certain spices that were only used in the sanctuary. So every time an Israelite wanted to approach the presence of God, they would smell that incense and it would remind them, I'm in a holy place. I know we have a policy here, no, uh, no perfume, but I don't think it would be a bad idea if this church had a smell that reminded you that you're in a holy place. But remember, the sanctuary, it's all about who? It's all about Jesus. Jesus said that he lives to make intercession with us. Jesus is in heaven doing a work of intercession. And because of him, your voice in heaven is heard. Your prayers, when you pray to God, they don't just hit the ceiling and bounce down off it. Because of Jesus, your voice transfers all the way to the throne room of God. Amen? Past the holy place, like most of you know, was the most holy place. And in the holy, most holy place was only one piece of furniture. Do you guys remember what that one piece of furniture was? The Ark of the Covenant. This was a representation of the throne room of God. If you see there on top, there were these two cherubims. And the throne room of God had these two cherubims in the Old Testament sanctuary. And this is where the presence of God would actually reside, upon the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, there were items that some people forget about. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant, there was the Ten Commandments. Next to the Ten Commandments, there was Aaron's rod. Next to Aaron's rod, there was manna. And that lid where the angels or those cherubim would rest, that was known as the mercy seat. But remember, what is the sanctuary all about? Don't get sick of it. It's about Jesus. The Ten Commandments reveal to us the character of God. It tells us that Jesus is just. That rod, Aaron's rod that was once dead, it, was sprung, it sprung forth full of life that show us that in the presence of God, dead, dead things can come back to life. That manna that was supposed to rot in one day, it shows that in the presence of God, life can be preserved eternal in Jesus. And I love the mercy seat. I love the mercy seat because above all else, it shows us that Jesus is merciful. And notice here, the mercy seat, is it above or is it below where the Ten Commandments lay? It's above. God's mercy always trumps God's justice. And I'm thankful for that this morning, aren't you? You know, when you visit someone's home, you learn uh, a lot about a person's home, at least I think, by what's laying around the person's house. If I go to your home and I look at what's around your house, I can tell a lot about you by what's in your house. If you were to go to my home, you would see uh, a box of pizza. <laughs> and then when I'm really not taking care of myself, you would see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine boxes of pizza. Uh, because it tells me you something about myself. It tells you that I like pizza. <laughs> I do. If you guys want to get me a going away gift. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. Uh, if I, go, if I were to go inside of your home, I would most likely see pictures of your family all throughout the walls of your home. And it tells me something about you. It tells me that you love and value your family. What's in your home 
tells you a lot about the person. Even if I go to your yard and I go outside and in your driveway there is a hockey net, it tells me something about you. It tells me that you like hockey. Hopefully it's the Calgary Flames. <laughs> I don't want to get into that. <laughs> uh, if I go to your yard and I see beautiful flowers or I see beautiful uh, shrubbery, it tells me something about you. It tells me that you like nature, that you like gardening. A person's home tells you a lot about a person. And God's house, God's house is in the sanctuary. God's house is the sanctuary. And every piece of furniture in the sanctuary tells us about Jesus and the work that he's trying to do for you. Each piece of furniture, it tells us something about Jesus, but I need you to catch this. Every piece of furniture outside the court of the sanctuary and inside the court of the sanctuary, even though it tells us something about Jesus, it's there for you. Think about it. Does God need a burnt uh, altar of sacrifice? Does God need forgiveness? Of course not. He has it there for you. Does God need a laver full of water to be cleansed? Of course not. God has that laver, that basin, so that you can be cleansed. God doesn't need bread. God doesn't need light. He is light. He has it there for you. That altar of incense, God doesn't need an intercessor to communicate. God has it there for you. You think God needs a reminder in the Ark of the Covenant to remind himself that he's just, that he's merciful, that in him is life? No, my friends, God has it there for you. The sanctuary is God's house, and it tells us a lot about him, yes. But think about it. Everything in God's house is for you. Everything in the sanctuary tells us that God is doing a work in heaven for the last 2,000 years, and it's so that you can be with him. In Daniel, there's a prophecy that I'm not going to go into detail, um, that Jesus is in the sanctuary, and he's cleansing the sanctuary. It's a simple way of saying, you know what? Jesus is almost done with the work that he's been doing for the last 2,000 years. He's almost done cleaning up the universe from the effects of sin entirely. I would encourage you guys, if you don't understand or if you haven't looked for yourself, Daniel 8.14, really look at Daniel 8.14. It is the reason our church exists. Friends, God is in heaven, and he's cleaning his house up for you because he wants you to be there. But he's not going to force you to be there. He's not going to twist your arm and drag you into heaven. God has done everything in heaven so that you can be there, but he's not going to force you. And guys, God has done so much so that we can be with him. He has traveled so far so that you can be with him. He has worked so hard so that you can be with him. And God has attempted everything in his power so that you can be with him. Follow this. In the beginning, God wanted to be with his children. And in Exodus 25, verse 8, he said, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But you know what? His living, condi his living conditions in the sanctuary, it wasn't good enough for him. His living conditions in the sanctuary wasn't close enough to his people. There were way too many walls of separation. So God, he moved a little closer. And he sent Jesus, also known as Emmanuel, God with us. God wanted to be close to us, and the walls of separation were too grit, big, so he sent Jesus in the flesh. He sent Jesus so that he could be face to face with us that our relationship with him would be more real, that our interactions with him would be better. But you know what? Even Jesus coming here, God coming here in the flesh, it wasn't good enough for him. 
there were too many limitations for Jesus. He could only be at one place at one time, and so God did something else. As Jesus ascended to heaven, God moved a little closer, and he sent the Holy Spirit so that God would not just live among us. No, that God would not just live and walk around us. He sent the Holy Spirit that God would live in you because God wants to be with you so much. Throughout the Bible, we see a story of a God who has done everything in his power to move closer and closer to his people. And the wonderful thing about the sanctuary, it is a constant reminder that Jesus is coming soon so that we can be with him in heaven. Friends, I cannot wait to be with God in heaven because it will no longer be a story of Jesus moving to earth time and again, trying to get closer and closer to us in this sin-sick world. But it will be us who go up to heaven to be with him. Friends, Jesus wants you to be there. But I want to warn you, only those who walk with Jesus on earth are going to be the ones who walk with Jesus in heaven. And so my question for you today is, do you want to walk with Jesus in heaven? Then what is stopping you from walking with him on earth? You know, just in 2009, uh, I have a, just a short story to tell you as I close. Uh, I got a job in Florida at a summer camp. And I came home in the beginning part of the of the summer to stay up in Canada, but at the end of the summer, uh, the latter part of the summer, I went to Florida. And during my first week at summer camp, uh, I got sick. I got really sick, and it got to the point where I was no longer able to work at the camp. And I was so sick that I wasn't even able to travel back home to Calgary to get help. And so the directors, they called up my parents. They said, hey, your son needs help. He needs to go get a place that he can get help. And so my dad, my dad has been working in the construction world, and he was at this time having a huge, serious project and a very big deadline. And so you know what my dad did? He dropped his project. At the last minute, he purchased an extremely expensive ticket. For himself and for me, he flew down all the way to Florida. He picked me up. He went with me every step of the way, through every airport, through every hotel, to get me back to Calgary so that I could be with him safely, so that I could be with him uh, without any worry. And you know what? As I, I think about my own father, and I know you can think about your fathers, uh, they're just a representation of what God is like. He's done everything in his power to be with you. And whatever it is, guys, that is stopping you from walking with him now, that will prevent you from walking with him in heaven, I got to appeal to you to give it up. Do not allow anything to affect your relationship with God here on earth. It's not worth it. Let it go. God bless you.